live. Okay, welcome to Senate Finance. We are going to take a look at the deficit. Mark is going to share that good news with us one mm -hmm. more time about what we're looking at. Um, and then I, I talked to Mark and Steve and uh, the treasurer last week about, so if we can't fill that hole, what are our options? Because before we go home, we've got to set a tax rate. <laughs> and um, so we're gonna go over that today, just so we know what the options are. It doesn't, look like we're going to do broadband on Thursday because the commissioner is not available, but they are supposed to um, release to the public their uh, telecom plan today. I'm assuming, I hope it's the same plan they gave to us this week, but Faith will send us all the link to that, that when it comes out. And then there is some discussion going on about trying to hire some expertise for us quickly. I just talked to Representative Briglin so that we can sort through these plans. I spent this morning doing telemedicine and some connectivity issues, um, but just to figure out because we still have like a six month window to get this money in and spent or committed. And so I think we're gonna, seems to be both in appropriations and with leadership, some feeling that we do need um, somebody to help us sort it through. So that's being discussed um, probably at higher levels than me but um, it's in the happening. So this Thursday, we're not, we're gonna, I, we're slated to have a joint meeting with the House Committee. Um, they're gonna wait. They haven't had the presentation on the plan. So we'll probably schedule them for next Tuesday when we've all seen the plan. And then this Thursday, Senator Sorotkin, you had a couple bills that you sent over to us the last day and you said you would like to get them out. I think they were housing bills, but we can, since we may be able to start moving into those, we can take a look at them. Okay. I, I know that House Ways and Means is will be voting out a miscellaneous tax bill shortly. Um, the yield bill is not ready, surprise yet. Um, and then they are working on a short-term borrowing bill to get to us to uh, deal with the possibility of the state, the towns having to borrow to pay the uh, the, all the property tax, and then the state either covering or helping to cover some of that borrowing costs. So they're working on that, and those two bills will be over. The short-term borrowing uh, will have to be pretty fast because we are, uh, they, the towns have a June 1st deadline. So as soon as that's headed our way, and I know the treasurer is prepared to kind of give us her presentation on that today. So that's the long range planning as far as it goes. I think it's through next Tuesday. Um, but anything else, any of you would like to get on the agenda, just let me know or anybody you'd like to hear from, let me know and we'll get it done. We also were scheduled Thursday, Senator Campion um, to hear from the gentleman at the public service department who's been doing all the technical support for the CUDs. Um, the House has heard from them and we haven't. And Faith sent us all a link to 
kind of listen, we can listen to their testimony, kind of saving their time. Okay. So um, we'll get oh, so that. Rather, that makes sense. Yeah, rather than tie them all up, I have a feeling some of them are part-time work in other places. And, yeah, good point. Uh, so we'll just get an overview. Anything I've heard says, other than EC Fiber, which is a world unto itself, um, nobody is really ready to start stringing poles and wires with federal money at this point, unless CV Fiber was the farthest down the road. And I think they were working with EC Fiber to do Roxbury. That might be the only exception okay. out there, but um, that seems to be it. Senator Pearson. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, the other day, Maria said something about uh, exploring the concept of whether or not we could hold some of this money in escrow, and and the the idea that she was right. working on a strategy um, to help us with the timing. And I just wonder. I, I don't want to let that drop. No. Um, it is, uh, and, and maybe for staff that's on the line. Do we understand that to be an ongoing project? It, it surely applies in more than just the area of telecom, but yeah. just figured it, it, it was worth mentioning and see if we could make sure not to lose that thread. Yeah, no, my understanding is that that's on joint fiscal's radar. I think you all got copies. There's more and more guidance comes out of Washington, but that is still one of the big questions. What do they mean by dispersed? Um, which is probably um, one of the things we need some help on figuring out. I think for right now, the we need to at least have it committed in six months somehow. So um, that's probably the safest road to go until we hear something else. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. We're, that, uh, uh, also, I, I think ought to be on our agenda is how we respond to the broadband expansion. And even though we may not know the details of how the money will come, under what circumstances, and under what restrictions, it's not too late for us to at least begin trying to understand a strategic framework around yeah. how this broadband expansion under this bill fits into our overall strategy, if any, to extend broadband throughout Vermont. Right. Although we've heard from the department, and I know the department has provided some more detailed uh, response to Senator Sorokin's questions, uh, it nonetheless is a, a real concern to me that I don't see an overall strategy. Uh, I've spoken right. to uh, Representative Sebelia, the head of, of the uh, uh, Joint IT Oversight Committee. I know she's spoken to Representative Briglin uh, on her committee in the House. And uh, again, between us, it seems to me, we, we ought to be driving from a legislative perspective of how we want this thing to, to roll out and under what circumstances will all of us be comfortable. Right, and I think, I don't know if you were on the call, but apparently I just, I heard a rumble last week and it got presented to money chairs today that Senate leadership, has recognized that moving this quickly, we really don't seem to have the in, in Senate, you know, we don't have our own voice <laughs> to help us figure out how we move forward in the, you know, without doing harm and their, their joint fiscal is working to see if they can't get us some um, expertise as quickly as possible. Good. And I just talked to Representative Briglin about that. So um, I think we, yeah, we've got lots of proposals, but I don't know enough to know if, if they're good. I mean, I don't, I need my own expert like we can with joint fiscal and say, what is this tax you know, is this a good tax plan? Is it a bad tax plan? Um, Senator McDonald, I see you. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Brock's asking the right question. Once again, we're not talking, when we talk about broadband, we're not using numbers. Um, right. So 
when some people talk, they think it's 25-3. Our committee's made a policy that we're not going to encourage or support anything that isn't symmetrical and higher. So when we seek information, um, we need to keep it in that framework. And as someone who represents EC fiber territory, I'm not making this argument for EC fiber who already has its ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking on behalf of, of the other areas that are unserved that may we may somehow be unwittingly put in a position of supporting more 25 three broadband and thereby making the eventual symmetrical broadband more expensive for everyone else. Um, okay. Which is, okay, thank you. All right. No, we, we have set our principles down. I think they're clear. Um, we'll see if we can live by them. Okay. <laughs> Mark, off we go. Back to the good news. Good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, Faith, uh, are you able to put up the balance sheet that I that I sent you earlier today? Um, yeah, I will in just a minute. Okay. 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 Hey, there it is. Okay. So, what I have to present uh, to you this afternoon is um, an education fund outlook that includes um, a new revenue forecast um, as of April 27th. I can't remember when I was last in to go over this, so I'm gonna assume that this is all new to you, although it might not be. So um, FY19 is there for reference. FY20 is where we now think we're gonna end the current uh, fiscal year. Um, it's not shown on the sheet, but you'll remember, I think from an earlier presentation that we initially thought that in FY20, we were going to close the year with a full stabilization reserve plus about a $12.9 million surplus. Um, since that time, um, since the COVID-19 related impacts on the consumption taxes have been um, forecasted, we are now in a very different position. Um, Faith, can you scroll down to the bottom of the sheet? So... Um, the, there was an approximately $54 million reduction in the um, non-property tax revenue forecast that we had in place in January. That's back up, up on top on the sources line, but the impact of it you can see right here, which is instead of having right here, instead of, instead of having down on line 31, a $12.9 million surplus, it's now empty. And instead of having a $36.4 million stabilization reserve, we now have an empty stabilization reserve and actually a $3.7 million um, deficit that will be carried forward into FY21 if everything we're expecting to happen comes through. I wanna reiterate that this is in many ways, it's a best case scenario because we're assuming that all the education property tax money that's due to the fund comes in on time. And all we also assume that about $20 million in deferred um, taxes from the um, sales and use tax and the meals and rooms tax that businesses would normally be remitting to the state come in by the end of July and are, and are um, accounted for for um, FY 2020. So best case scenario is we're heading forward into FY 21 with a $3.7 million deficit and an empty re stabilization reserve. So Faith, can you um, page back up to the top again? So well, that deficit's looking better though. I it, mean- it, it, it did, it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's improved over time. And that's why I said, I, I couldn't remember when I came in last, it was initially forecasted at $89 million um, shortfall in the yeah. non-property tax monies, then 69 and now 54. That now is a consensus um, number with the administration. Um, but that's only true for FY20. The numbers I'm going to show you for FY21 have a revenue up, update in them, but they're not yet consensus. The administration is uh, wanting to wait till mid-May in order to do that because they think we'll have a better idea at that right. point. But, um, anyways. So, so the deficit for this year is 54 or 3.7? 
there's a $3.7 million deficit in yes. the education fund that reflects right. loss of $54 million in nonprofit okay. monies. Okay, everybody clear? That's clear. We lost $54 million, so we went through all our reserves and we there ended up with 3.7 right. uncovered. Yep, $36 million reserve and a $13 million surplus all gone, plus a little bit more. Okay, okay. question. Yes, Senator to be done. How does, um, is, how are the 19 budgets yet to be voted on counted in this forecast? Um, well, the, we, we, now you're talking about FY21, not 2020, right? So I haven't gotten there yet, but for- um, FY... thank, um, I withdraw my question. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I can answer it. That. The, the answer is, is that they're, they're in there at, their, um, at the board approved budget levels and they will be adjusted when the legislation that's currently working its way through House and Senate education gets dealt with, but it won't, won't move the needle very much on these numbers in any case. I, I was pre premature, my apology. <laughs> okay, no problem. So FY21, um, I, I don't really know what to include in here, so I'm gonna to explain to you what I've used for assumptions and you can see what it does to the bottom line. So first of all, up here, um, I, I keep thinking you can see my cursor, but on lines A, B, and C, those property tax parameters are the ones that were put in place or recommended by the tax commissioner back in January. So I have nothing else to go on at this point. So I, I use those, I assume those were gonna be the rates. Um, then down on lines four, five, six, and seven, those lines reflect an additional $113 million reduction in non-property tax monies coming into the education fund in FY21. Okay. So then um, Faith, if you can page down all the way down to the bottom again, um, you can see here that there's $111.2 million operating shortfall as a result of that. Um, and that um, necessitates, oh, again, sorry, if we fill a reserve, which is on line 27 back to the $38 million that, mm -hmm. we're, that we require to get to 5%. So fill a reserve, deal with the non-property tax revenue shortfall and address the $74 million increase in education spending that's been approved by voters already. And you can drop all the way down to the bottom line here and the bad news is down here on line 31. We're about $153 million short of balancing the education fund under, the, under, those, under those assumptions. Okay, and the most we could do is we could do a notwithstanding and not fill up the reserves. That wouldn't, I'm sure the treasurer would say Wall Street wouldn't be happy. Correct. But that would drop us down to 111 million. Yes. Yeah. And that yeah. would mean yeah. That would mean you'd be pushing that forward forward to next year, and I don't know what that would do to the state's ability to borrow money to deal with this problem. And we have so, no idea what next year will look like. That that's right, and this is effectively you know if if you, there's there have been a number of proposals that. Um, have been addressed and ways and means started to look at them, but the rug kind of got pulled out from under them this morning when we got um, the new guidelines from the um, Treasury on how you can use the CRF money, the one and a quarter billion dollars we have. Um, ways, ways and means was looking at a number of proposals that were hoping we could use some of that money to solve this problem. The guidance that came out yesterday seems to preclude that as a possibility. I think Abby may be on this call if you wanna talk more about that. But um, right now, I don't know. I, I, one, of the, one of the things we were gonna talk about is options for addressing this problem. And um, a couple of them at least have gone out the window, I think with the, with the new guidance that came out this morning. So. Okay. So any questions for Mark at this point? <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I have a question while we're talking about the reserves, and, and I think if the treasurer is still on the line, is there, uh, we've been talking about it as we leave it at zero or we go to third, the full 38 million. And I guess I wonder for the treasurer or Mark, is there, there has to be some in between ground. If, if yes. we, if we set it up on a three year uh, you know, restabilization to do the credit agencies. I assume that's better than leaving it at zero. And, but is that a fair assumption? 
also, um, if I, Madam Chair, if I could, um, yes. I think that uh, leaving it at zero versus having a having a, a plan to um, uh, uh, to fill it over time is obviously better. Um, second option is better. I think what what I've seen fr uh, from conversations and with other states as well as um, our financial advisor is that uh, rating agencies as a whole, there's some differences as they're looking at it, um, are looking through the crisis to the other side. What is it going to look like? So they're allowing folks some time um, to um, uh, to to get back to uh, where they need to be. Um, I would say that uh, if you take a look at the fiscal year 20. Um, um, deficit, um, I, you know, and again, I, uh, this is, this is conjecture on my part, um, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, that's, that's a, that's a short-term look. The concern that I have is that uh, the long-term look uh, into the next couple of years in terms of the structural uh, issues with the uh, Ed Fund are a little bit more con uh, concerning to me. Um, right now, I think the emphasis is on liquidity, emphasis is getting through this, and using the correct measures, I think that there's some expectation that uh, uh, that there would be some use of reserves. Although later, uh, if we get to the discussion of accrual versus reserves, um, I'd, I'd like to be heard on that. But um, okay. I can't say for say. Um, but uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. Yeah, I think that does. <laughs> and I think one of the problems that we're having, I know the economists are, is if you're in a recession, there, there's patterns to recessions. And so you mm -hmm. can predict where you think you're gonna go and how quickly you're gonna move out. This one is subject to a virus and they still have no way of knowing if we're gonna, you know, how this virus pattern is gonna run. So to say we're gonna be out of it next year and we might find out it resurges and we're shut down longer next year. It's, that's what's making yeah. this so hard. We can't, there's just no reliable data to put in the computer to get a reliable answer or prediction out, so. We are all um, seeing how we deal with indefinites. Yes. All right. Um, so Brad, anything you can help us with and what's the agency thinking um, about the deficit? I know you've had a couple weeks to think about it. Um. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, what what I've what I've been trying to do is get a handle on what we know is going to be the the cost of the Ed Fund next year. So I've been working with Chloe and Mark a little bit, getting um, information on the uh, on some of the budgets that we haven't heard about that that actually passed. There were probably about fifteen to twenty that passed that did not give us preliminary information. So I have most of those data at the moment. Um, we have rough ideas of where people are going to be based on, um, for, the, for the 19 that don't have budgets, for getting the pending legislation. Um, we have rough idea of where they th we think they're gonna come in. So what I'm trying to do right now is pull all that together and get that over to Chloe and Mark so that they can, they can look at the Ed Fund a little more clearly in terms of FY21, what the school districts are gonna be expecting. The only thing that, that I can think of that has really come up um, as, as a possible, not solution by any means, but um, to offset this a little bit is to allow people to move their reserves and the surplus they have that may be sitting there. Current language, and I think I've mentioned this to you guys before, current language says that um, use of any reserves requires voter approval if it's not for the intended purpose. Um, so I've had several business managers ask me if that could be way for one, two, possibly three years. And the second piece of that is if they happen to be ending a year with a surplus, maybe, maybe not this year, but if they happen to be ending the year with a surplus, um, generally speaking, the process for that is any surplus generated in FY20 is audited in FY21 and is then available for use in FY22. And they were, they were thinking if they managed their money well, they had a rough idea of what it would be in FY21 or what the, the, the magnitude of it would be for FY20. If they could, if they would be allowed to use that without being an audited um, amount, 
So those are a couple of things that came from the business managers. Okay, but we still have to collect to the budgeted amount. So this might help them out. Has anyone talked about the, I think it's $27 million the schools are getting a portion of? Yep, um, that, that's still, it's, I can't remember what the number is, I think it's around 28.1 million, something like that. I don't remember off the top of my head. We haven't gotten the money yet, um, but we know pretty much what it is. Um, it, it is, again, we're still waiting for guidance from the federal folks as to what it can really be used for. Um, there's been discussions both in your committee and other committees as to ways to treat that money. I don't know as we've come out as an agency with any, anything specific that we're recommending. I do know that Secretary French has been very concerned with when he's talking to superintendents, very concerned with the cost of special education. Uh, there will be compensatory um, costs coming, compensatory services coming coming up that where, where kids are not being served properly right now that will help be made up for. There's possible um, more work in the end of the school year. Um, then there are, there's also there's also a concern that um, that mental health care costs are, are going to go up too. So he, he's, he's very concerned with those two areas specifically. He would also mm -hmm. like to recommend people looking to the future that this may not be unusual anymore and, and looking to build out, if you guys are talking about more broadband and how to get things like that working, do some more serious infrastructure. Okay, yeah. And mental health seems to be one that they seem to feel does well over um, telecom. Okay, so no magic bullets, huh? No magic bullets at the moment. It looks like they may be planning to use that money and given the federal guidelines today, using it to offset state payments to the schools might be off the table and it looks like they may be using it for increased special ed um, and healthcare service counseling. Okay, um, any questions for Brad at this point? All right. I, I do have a question, Madam Chair. Okay. Brad, um, can you, can, I, I, I'm not sure you're the appropriate person, but what about meal service? Uh, there's a lot of concern that that gets clipped off and halted sometime in June and and uh, given the poverty and, and income, uh, drastic changes people have for income, there's some hope that uh, maybe we could extend it or be a little more aggressive in our summer meals program. Is that something we should talk to somebody else about or do you have any sense of the agency's direction on that front? I understand it. Well, the first, the first part is, is I, I pass that question off to of Rosie Kruger <laughs> um, and I, I, I can get in touch with her, but I, my understanding is that, that school districts are gearing up to, to really keep this going through the, the, um, through the summer. That, that's, that's what I've been hearing anecdotally. I, I will get in touch with Rosie and get some more information from him. He's probably a better person to talk to about than I am since that's what she does. Okay. Okay. Okay, any other questions at this point, committee? It's just, just about deficits, Madam yes. Chair? Uh, yeah, deficits, numbers. Well, I, just, I had a question about the 19 school districts and um, that haven't voted yet. And I, I formulated a proposal that maybe Mark um, Kral could, could um, put into print, but uh, I could share okay. that with the committee I, now or... or I, I, the briefing we got, I think it was chair's meeting. I'm looking to Senator Ballant to see, yeah. Is that Senate, you, you can do drive-through, you can do mail-in ballot, this, you know, you, you can still hold an election. That the Senate is looking at, and he said they are unanimous, that you can use last year's budget um, and run your school with that. And, and that's if you don't get your budget voted by, is it July 1st, June 1st? I think it's July, but you can hold an election anytime, but going forward, it would be last year's budget and no, you wouldn't have to borrow it. 
it would get paid through the ed fund the house is looking or planning on the last year plus the four percent since that's what the average amount other budgets went up um i believe negotiations are in the future but those are the two proposals that are on the floor that i know of is the uh, four one. the four percent which is the average set the average of additional spending or the average of um, spending per pupil. Uh, Brad has got his hand up. Yes, I, I, I do. Um, it would be for for education spending, not spending per pupil. Um, and I would just jump back the, the, the most recent draft. I just read Madam Chair on the House's proposal is not quite the FY20 plus a percent plus uh, an inflator. In order. Okay. What it what it says is more that um, the agency will be able to be given the authority to authorize a budget that would be equal to the FY21 proposed education, but not a part let me rephrase that, It'd be authorized to allow education spending, not a budget, education spending equivalent to what, what they, what um, the board approved given the, the, if I recall right, I think even for the ones that failed, the, the school boards have to come back with a uh, have a vote for a budget that is less than than what they initially came in because the voters already said no to that one. So it's a it's a little bit it's, less straightforward, I think, than the FY twenty plus four percent, four and a half percent is. But that's that's kind of where it stands right now. And I think I think Madam Chair is correct. There will be discussion between the two sides. So, Senator McDonald, that give you a framework of what's out there uh sort of but if you're one of the 19 towns what can you expect i, I you can expect the ability to continue voting um you can expect that if you don't pass a a budget that but you have put a budget out there that that the agency will be given the authority to say that is what your education spending will be. And then you, you're, 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 you would be able to spend any of the money that's coming like federal money, special ed, money, et cetera. But the education spending amount going into the ed fund. So just Madam Chair, uh, mm -hmm. fundamentally anybody who is voting on a budget after today is voting in a different universe than all those folks who voted oh, yeah. early. And yeah. I would hope that we would find a way to make the 19 that are unvoted, to put them at the same status of those who have already voted with a, 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 an amount of money that puts them in that ballpark, whether it's percentage of spending or percentage of spending per pupil or merging those two and mm -hmm. finding the middle ground and give them the provision that that's their budget for next year, unless, they hold and call for a special meeting to reduce it. Um, if we simply authorize them to go out and spend more money in this different universe, um, right. it it's not going to come out with a, with a it's going to come out disproportionately for those school districts um, and the students in them. So I would uh, hope we would. Keep that in mind, and I may ask Mark to draft something that would outline how to achieve something like that for the Senate Finance and Education to recommend or reject. Yeah, I would encourage you to talk to Education, yeah, because um, they they're working on it. Senator Pearson, Brad, does the administration have a position on the two proposals, the House Senate, or or are you? Could you make that clear for us? Not, not that I've heard of. This is all still bubbling in the background as far as I believe the agency is concerned, except for me. Um, I'm not sure if Secretary French is aware of these. I'll bring it back to his attention. So I think I think he knows what's going on, but I'm not sure. We, we haven't a chance to talk about what, what his, his thoughts are. Okay. All right. Anything else? Okay, at this point, we're going to go to Treasurer Pierce. Welcome, Beth. You're here. You're on the phone. Yes. Okay. So thank you. 
There for the you record, go. Yes, you've got yes, her uh, presentation. I'm jumping ahead of you. My apologies. So, uh, for the record, Beth Pierce is state treasurer, and um, I don't have any um, silver bullets as well. So uh, we're uh, we're going to have to, you know, muddle through this and, and work together. And, uh, and my my experience is that uh, when we work together, we find solutions. But let me get to um, a couple of things. Uh, what I understood, and I and um, uh, from from the previous presentation is that uh, in order to get to that uh, that 3.7 uh, million dollar deficit in 20, you're assuming two things: one, that you'll be able to accrue the sales tax, and secondly, uh, that you will receive the um, uh, the money that uh, is coming to the um, to the um, uh, Ed Fund on June 1st. Uh, with respect to the first one, the accrual, um, I I believe that that's a a, a, a way to handle this, uh, and there's some advantages to doing that. Uh, first, if you don't do it, what happens is that uh, in 2020, the the, uh, the the financial statements are going to look very, very, very um, low, thin. Uh, and then the next year, when you not that we're going to have a good year in 21, but you'll have twice the collection. Or, or some portion of that one and a half or whatever that might be in 2021. And then it reverts back to, um, to, to something that's closer to normal, but obviously we're gonna, normal is not gonna happen for some time uh, in 22. And what that does is you've got a, a low, a high, and then, then a middle ground. And for comparability purposes, I don't think that that uh, uh, is what you would want in a, uh, in a budgetary statement. So I think that uh, making that adjustment from accrual um, seems to to be something. I'm not the accountant. I'm not the state comptroller or the okay. state budget officer. Yes. No. Did someone I just said that. No, okay. that's fine. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, I've had some conversations. I've, um, I'm chair of um, the president of NASDAQ, the National Association of Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, and we've convened a group of um, six comptrollers across the country and six treasurers, including myself, and we're working through some of these issues. And we hope to have a little bit more clarity on this particular issue in the next couple of days. We've got a weekly meeting that uh, that uh, we'll have tomorrow. But uh, I think that that, for, just from a, a, you know, comparing one year to the next, that makes sense. Uh, gap accounting, um, and I'm, I'm looking over at uh, Senator Brock's uh, faces uh, on, on the YouTube as I'm saying this. Uh, gap accounting, you, you do do you know full accrual of that. Um, budget is up to the uh, up to the states. Uh, some states use a cash basis, some use modified accrual, some use a hybrid, um, and uh, you know the the ability to um, to make changes to that is up to the state, you know, going from one to the next and going all over the place um, in, in a normal circumstance would not be recommended. But I think that during these unusual times, that might be something you would consider. I think I would defer to Ledge Council and to, uh, to um, um, Joint Fiscal, but you may need some type of statutory language if you're going to do that in terms of, you know, a budgetary um, uh, presentation. Uh, again, I would defer to those folks. But that's something that uh, it, uh, gets you a little closer. Uh, the uh, the other piece in terms of uh, the, the the idea that we will receive it's roughly eighty eight million dollars. Uh, Brad has the exact number in his in his head uh, that we will be receiving on June first. The bills I believe have gone out, um, and our expectation is that we will receive that. Uh, there's still the uh, the penalty if you do not receive it uh, if they're not uh, turned over to us. But we have. And we'll get to that in just a minute. The uh, the PowerPoint that we have, and, and for me, I kept it under. I, I'm not sure if it's 10 or 12 uh, slides, which is a little unusual for me, but I'm working on that. But uh, by virtue of having a borrowing mechanism for the uh, for the um, uh, municipalities, uh, I think that we we have a better um, likelihood of collecting those dollars on June 1st. Uh, and we we do have a um, a proposal that uh, that House Ways and Means is looking at uh, to um, uh, to reimburse uh, communities for the cost of interest in that borrowing, and I think that's a a pretty good middle ground, uh, something that we feel pretty uh, uh, feel comfortable recommending, and we'll, in the PowerPoint we'll deal with that momentarily. But I think that gets you to that uh, 3.7 million dollar um, deficit using your reserves. In a, in, a, in a 
in a normal year, if, if there's something called normal anymore, um, you would having a deficit in a major fund, such as the education fund, would not be something that uh, would be looked on favorably by the rating agencies. And I still can't guarantee what 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 the end result will be with uh, with these issues. Um, but again, uh, what what we're seeing is that uh, the, the 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 literature that's going out there and the commentaries are that they're looking through the crisis onto the other side. So I'm uh, looking at this shorter term um, issue in 2020. I think that uh, uh, there's some understanding that there may be some use of reserves and in, in some, some of the other issues. I'm more concerned, frankly, about the longer term deficit um, and, and what that's going to look like in terms of, uh, of our process. And I know that you're talking through some ideas on that. We'd be happy to try to assist, but I think, you know, between Mark and Brad, you've got the, 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 the real experts there right now. Uh, but again, uh, that uh, that would be a, a concern. One of the things that might provide some relief on the municipal level, and I'm going to go back to that and then walk through something uh, that uh, also was in our presentation called the Community Disaster Loan Program. It's a program by FEMA. We've never utilized it in this state, although with legislation, state statute going back to, I think, 1975 um, that allowed you to use it in a in a um, in a disaster. Um, but uh, it's designed to provide a smoothing of those revenues. Again, that's not for the state, but for municipalities. Uh, smoothing of those revenues over uh, losses over a period of time. So if you have um, a certain level of reduction in your revenues, you can get a um, five-year financing through this program to kind of smooth that out. And an additional five years uh, is, is is an option. And there's also some um, some forgiveness in whole or in part. Uh, if if you have end up with a three year cumulative deficit, so it might be something that inter intertwines with how you're looking at the Ed Fund and how the municipalities uh, may have an opportunity. Now, as I say that, I also want to put out a word of caution. Usually, you have a um, you have a uh, uh, a uh, natural disaster uh, that hits one part of the country. You know, Sandy hit uh, you know New York and New Jersey. You know, we we were adversely impacted by Irene. Uh, North Dakota had some floods. Uh, there was an article in Governing Magazine that uh, referred to this as the hurricane uh, that hit across the country. So the, the capacity of FEMA to, to address these things is going to be strained. Um, and so the, the, there may be some um, additional issues in terms of both capacity and time frame. Um, I did see that uh, they, they seem to be gearing up somewhat. We're still trying to work out the mechanics of this, uh, but it may, may be of some help. Um, and, and as I'm looking through uh, through my notes here, I would say that um, uh, that borrowing, uh, for instance, if you said, well, let's borrow, you know, in, in the education fund, um, borrowing does not solve the problem. Uh, again, you you know, you would have cash, um, uh, but you would also have a um, a liability to pay back that borrowing. Uh, so um, again, for the uh, for the accountants in the room, debit to cash and a credit to a liability. Of, of, so your net impact on your bottom line financial statement would not change. Uh, so, but borrowing does help to pay the bills. If we were to do that, uh, we would go through our, our typical line of um, of uh, options, starting with our pooled cash through our interfund and our in our you know, letters of credit and long term borrowing. And that's going to bring me to the slides in just a second. But I did want to point out that uh, borrowing is not uh, something that uh, uh, necessarily um, is. Again, if you if you have a cash need uh, that, that needs to be addressed, but having those reserves, our cash position is relatively strong. Uh, we believe that we will get through this um, this first year without having to um, to do um, um, uh, an external borrowing, um, but. Um, when we had less reserves, that was not the case. In the early 1990s, Vermont was issuing someplace between 155 and 192 million in short-term debt obligations annually to uh, to get through the the peaks and uh, well, not the peaks, but the valleys in our cash flow. And they also had a 65 million dollar uh, deficit notes that were out there from uh, from the uh, the um, um, the problems in, I presume, 1990 and 1991. I don't have the, the dates of where that began, but again, there was a deficit borrowing that took some time to uh, um, to to uh, to pay back. So, um, 
And with that, um, I, I guess I'll stop for a minute and answer any questions. And then um, if that's okay with you again, Madam Chair, and then get into that presentation that hits on some of these issues. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. I think any questions committee? I am looking, I there it comes. I lost my video. Something popped up for an <laughs> app. Um, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay, I think, Madam okay. Treasurer, we can get to the slides. There we go. So if you put up the slides, um, uh, Faith, that would be helpful. And uh, I'm gonna walk through it here. And uh, when I say next page, that's when you'd, uh, you'd make the, uh, the change. Hopefully I'll remember to do that. Uh, um, that's not my best skill set, but we'll go through that. So, uh, so this is uh, titled Municipal Borrowing Education Fund Discussion, and it's dated May 5th. And uh, I don't know, do you have that up and available to you folks? It's up and it's on our website. There you and go. Now okay. it's on the screen. So let's go through the page two um, is the uh, state borrowing, the potential backstops. And uh, uh, one that's not on here is pooled cash. We, we pool our dollars together. So the ed fund, the, um, the, um, um, the general fund, the transportation fund, as well as others are in what's called pooled cash. Uh, that, uh, that permits you to pay the bills. Uh, we talked a little bit about that the last time I testified in front of you folks. Um, beyond that is the interfund borrowing that allows us to borrow against um, um, uh, um, what's called restricted funds, uh, funds that have specific purposes that are segregated, uh, some workers' comp funds, for instance, uh, some um, uh, uh, the state uh, state medical fund. Those those would be examples, but you have to pay them back. But it allows you to take care of those um, those. Uh, um, uh, valleys in your in your in your as I said you, when you look at our cash flow it's um, uh, I always refer to it with a very technical term it's lumpy so you have uh, peaks and you have valleys in the in the process um, the line of credit would be the next next thing that you would do going out to a bank uh, to get a line of credit for instance um, and then issuing um, um, issuing uh, short term debt. Uh, there is something that people are talking a lot about, uh, what's called a municipal liquidity facility with the Federal Reserve. It is not a good option for Vermont, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit uh, further down. Um, if we were looking at, you know, the education fund and, and the ability to pay pay the bills with that uh, particular um, um, shortfalls in those years, we would go through this process. We would use interfund uh, pooled cash, then we'd use interfund borrowing. Um, and, uh, and essentially use that bucket first. And if that bucket is uh, full, you move on to the line of credit. And if that bucket is full, you would, you would take a look at other types of short or, or long-term borrowing. My hope is, and, my, and our estimates are that, you know, we're, we're still in good shape. We're not looking for external mm -hmm. borrowing, um, but we're gonna have to take um, uh, the numbers from uh, Mark and Brad and put those into our, to our long-term cash flows and take a look at what that, uh, what that does. Uh, but we'll continue to look at that. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is um, municipal options. And they're similar, but yet different, as I say. Um, some towns, some larger towns might have some, um, some pooled cash um, accounts similar to ours and some inner fund borrowing. That's probably not the case uh, uh, most, most of the way through. Um, when, when towns need to, uh, when they have those peaks and, uh, not, excuse me, when they have those valleys, uh, they typically go through a process to um, to do a short-term borrowing, a line of credit, or a, 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 a revenue anticipation mm -hmm. note, or something along that line. Tax anticipation note in uh, in anticipation of property taxes to their local banks, and this happens on a on a regular basis. Um, and uh, uh, so many towns have relationships already with their banks. Uh, the banks have had a history of stepping up when we've had uh, problems in Irene. Uh, they offered very low cost um, uh, uh, financing arrangements, uh, uh, lines of credit uh, to towns while they were waiting for their um, FEMA funds to come in uh, for the natural disasters. I frequently talk about, uh, for instance, the town of Halifax. At the time, I think their population was roughly about 400. Their budget was under a million dollars. I think it's someplace in that area or possibly more now. 
and their damage was over four million dollars. So uh, uh, having some ability to uh, to do those lines of credit with their banks, uh, their uh, their bank of record was very important. Um, the bond bank really isn't an option for for them because of the bond bank really deals with physical infrastructure projects, uh, not short term revenue related. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll talk again about the community disaster loan. Uh, there's some options there that would be a takeout. So once you've done the short-term borrowing, dealing with some of your longer-term problems, uh, you, you might have uh, the ability to use these, uh, these uh, community disaster loans. And we'll continue to look at other options. If you go to the next page, so page four, getting back to education cash flows, uh, we uh, we remitted on time uh, the uh, the payments uh, X68 payments uh, to the um, uh, to, uh, to excuse me we we did the X68 payments were made by the state on April 30th it totaled 163.4 million uh, we the next payments are scheduled for September 10th and December 10th uh, what we're counting on at this point is the uh, the money coming in on on June 1st. That's approximately 88.76 million in the next due date. So that is December 1st. Uh, many municipalities are experiencing cash flow impacts due to the delays or deferrals of receipt of property taxes. And uh, we wanted to come up with a solution that provided some assistance to, uh, to those municipalities. Uh, the next chart, page five, is just a compilation. This was on your website, uh, so I... Um, and uh, Mark could probably explain this a little bit more, but right now it says outstanding due after 315, and that would be tax day could or after 315. Uh, my, and again, I'll take uh, correction from Brad or Mark, but my understanding would be that, that that's, that's the, the larger number, that uh, there will be some collections, uh, that uh, you have escrow accounts, uh, so that hopefully that number won't be quite as large as, as we're working through this. But um, page six, we, um, um, I, I just want to, usually I don't put into a presentation something that we're not going to do, but there was so much publicity about this. Uh, and uh, the federal government uh, said, we're going to come through and create this municipal liquidity facility uh, and state level issuers can uh, use these proceeds. Uh, they first said that uh, states can do this, uh, but uh, with respect to um, uh, municipalities doing this or counties doing this, which isn't a factor in Vermont, you had to have a million residents. They've since lowered that to 500,000. And cities had to have a, uh, 500,000, they've lowered that to 250. That's still not an answer for um, for Vermont. No. Um, states could, no. excuse me? <laughs> um, uh, states could do a, um, a support for those, uh, but uh, uh, for, for the respective uh, counties and cities, that created a whole host of other issues uh, in the program. Bottom line for me is, the, is right down at the bottom, it says interest rate pricing. The Federal Reserve um, does not see this as uh, something that uh, per their regulations, when they're doing this type of facility, they see themselves as the lender of last resort. And there would be a penalty rate, which is essentially a premium uh, uh, to the market rate. Uh, if we, and also my understanding is they would be looking for you to have exhausted your other resources, such as bank lines of credit or your own borrowing. And so we do not see this program as, as a option for Vermont, but it's been out there quite a bit. So I wanted to let you know, uh, because you're going to hear that uh, quite a bit as, uh, as folks are looking at options. Uh, our recommendation is on page seven. And it's to create, uh, to 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 uh, encourage short-term municipal borrowing through local banks. You know, through established networks, uh, banks do have net, um, uh, uh, relationships with the municipalities, uh, and those municipalities have done different types of um, of borrowings and short-term uh, lines over the years. And we would encourage folks to look at that. We've had many conversations with the Vermont Bankers Association and uh, the banks stand ready to assist in that. Um, to help defray some of the cost of doing this, uh, we, would, uh, we would recommend that interest payments be reimbursed by the state to manage the cash flow effects of these delays um, with a couple of caveats. Um, our hope is that, um, and going down to a, a bullet that's a little further down, that the state would be able to recover uh, the short-term borrowing costs uh, through the uh, 
Coronavirus Relief Fund, the CARES Act. Um, in order to do that, uh, we wanted to stay in compliance with the uh, the general parameters. So we would, uh, so if you, uh, going back to bullet two in the indent, uh, their short-term borrowing costs uh, would have to be not included in the municipality's budget um, uh, that was enacted before or pro um, on or before March 27th, that's per the CARES Act. Uh, that uh, the period is um, of eligible borrowing is from March 1st, to, uh, 2020 to December uh, 30th. Uh, never known why they didn't use to December 31st, but hey, um, and expenses must be consistent with the, uh, the CARES Act. Uh, so our intent with this would be cost for related to COVID because of the delay um, in receipt of those monies. You cannot, you cannot under the COVID guidance um, replenish that. You can't uh, provide uh, money for revenue um, uh, uh, shortfalls, but you can in our interpretation and based on a conversation um, and some notes that I saw from um, uh, the NGA, uh, National Governance Association, and NASBO, the National Association of State Budget Officers, I believe that's the right um, um, uh, name for that acronym, uh, that uh, with the Treasury uh, that uh, that uh, short-term borrowing expenses would be appropriate. We don't have a guarantee of that, uh, but uh, our, our, our uh, thought would be, you know, to appropriate the dollars and to the extent possible reimburse those through that uh, relief fund or any subsequent um, um, uh, amendment to the uh, to the relief fund or the um, or any subsequent act by Congress. And then, as I said, explore using the community disaster loan program for 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 uh, longer term needs. Uh, I'm going to move to page eight, which again, uh, it just happens to be the state's authorizing language. We won't go through that now. Uh, this is for the community disaster loan, and again, that gives a little bit of leeway and, and assistance to towns as a, as they're dealing with those revenue losses. Um, and as you see, that was added in 1975, even though we have not used it. So this program has been around for a while. It's still there. Um, uh, folks said, really? That's, and I noticed that um, several um, um, employee um, uh, um, platforms or, or recruitment platforms, and by the way, I'm not looking for another job. I was checking them out for this purpose. Uh, the uh, FEMA is, um, is, is apparently gearing up for this program. Uh, so that's a good sign. Um, the, on page nine, you see the, um, the, the, the general parameters of this program uh, so that uh, a municipal uh, government could borrow up to five million. And the term again is five years, may be extended. And uh, they do have some uh, forgiveness, which is always a good thing. Um, and uh, we would encourage folks to take a look at this. We will be working with the administration. If you go to page 10, you see that uh, it, it references a, um, uh, a person, uh, it's on the item number four on the flow chart, the governor's authorized representative and we've been in contact with um, the administration to try to figure out who would be that authorized representative. Right now, we're taking the lead in having those initial discussions, but it it, uh, it would seem to us that uh, some type of um, um, uh, handoff would be appropriate, although it is required that the state um, approve or, or review the loan applications, and we would certainly want to take a look at the um, um, the finances of that as, as part of our office. Um, so I've gone rather fast through the uh, the charts. I apologize. I know that I tend to speak quickly, um, but um, I will leave it at that and um, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, but I think this does provide some help for municipalities. How that interacts with the um, with the education fund, uh, there's some 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 um, linkages there, and be happy to talk uh, further about those issues and work with this committee. Um, it is important that this uh, bill, uh, going back to what um, uh, the chair said earlier, that uh, with June 1st coming along, uh, we'd like to give municipalities some certainty in terms of that reimbursement of um, of the interest expense, and uh, so. Um, um, as, as everything is in this particular uh, moment of crisis, um, as soon as possible, um, uh, is, is advisable. And with that, I will stop um, and take any questions. Okay, so in summary, the towns would borrow as they do now, yep. assuming for a larger amount, the state would use CARES COVID money 
um, and reimburse the towns for the eligible expense. So if they have budgeted regularly borrowing for property, you know, for standard tax flow, cash flow, that amount wouldn't be counted, but anything additional caused by this COVID virus um, would be. And then we would look to the municipal disaster loans or steer towns in that direction for more um, severe revenue losses or for their revenue losses due to non-payment of property tax or um, whatever other issues um, that come up, but probably loss of revenue. So committee, any questions? None? Uh, just to clarify, here. sure, I'll jump in. Um, Madam Treasurer, you're saying that the, the COVID dollars would be used to reimburse municipalities for the interest charges on the loans. Do I have that? that that's all right. in terms of state spending of the CARES Act. That, that would be the expense, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And how do we, um, and you said we need to basically try to figure this out this month if we can. How do we begin to estimate what that would cost? I mean, it, it is the project to survey municipalities and try to get them to give us a, a range of estimates, is, in your opinion? Sure. Well, I think that we would work with the league um, and uh, have some conversations with them. Going back to that chart that uh, was earlier in the presentation, I'm going to go back to, uh, hold on, I'll get to the right page here. Um, and again, I'm going to defer to Brad and company, but 132, um, uh, 132 million of outstanding. Again, I think the number is actually considerably less than that. But if you if you were to take a look at uh, at that as a starting point, if it was in fact 132 million, um, it would uh, it would uh, and and let's say the interest rate was two percent, and you did this for a half a year, that would be about 1.3 million dollars. If you said we're going to collect 75% of that, um, you would um, you you you'd have a um, a different number in there. Um, I'm going to quickly do that. Um, you'd ha you'd have about uh, 99 million dollars of of um, of, of um, shortfall. Uh, that's about 1.9, 1. 1. Um, or just under two million dollars for the year, and about 990 thousand for a half a year. Um, so we would need to have some conversations and do some estimating between um, tax um, and um, uh, the league and uh, and um, uh, see if we can get a, a better feel with Mark on this and uh, and get a better feel uh, for this. There is uh, language that's already being looked at in House Ways and Means. Uh, they, 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 they took testimony in that today uh, from myself, from Karen, uh, from others, and uh, um, they're going to make, we're going to meet actually with um, um, Becky uh, later on today and see if we can tweak that, that language a little bit and certainly get that over to you folks as well. But um, uh, it's a little hard to, to get a handle on that and we're going to need to do some quick discussions about that. But maybe, I'm missing, Go ahead. maybe I misunderstood, but so this is only for the municipal ed fund liability, not for mm -hmm. their own operating uh, yeah. budgets. Is that accurate? Yeah, essentially this cannot be used just as COVID can't be used to cover revenue loss here um, in the state level, it can't at the local level as well, but it can be used to defray the interest cost of a borrowing over and above your, your normal op, um, borrowing um, because of the, uh, the COVID. At least that's the interpretation we have now. Um, and there is some risk in doing this because if it is not, it's deemed later not to be covered, we'd, we'd have to appropriate those dollars. But um, um, this is, uh, uh, and our suggestion is to create a separate fund to do this so it has its own fund integrity. Uh, and um, uh, there is a risk, but I think it's a risk that um, uh, has some prob fair, fair to good probability associated with reimbursement. And I think it's the right thing to do for the uh, um, for the uh, municipalities as well. So that that seems clear to me. But if they are 
if towns are struggling to collect property tax in order to reimburse the state for ed funds, they're also by default having struggling to mm -hmm. collect their municipal tax. And, yeah. and I guess I'm wondering if anyone's had conversations or, you know, we talked about this when we did just a very simple vote authorization for municipalities in terms of changing their due dates is the logical follow-up thanks for covering our borrowing costs for the ed fund could you also cover our borrowing costs for municipal funds and and i just wonder i'm not against for or against that I, i'm just wondering if anyone's had that conversation to your knowledge uh no um I, and again i want to be very um uh, I want to take a look at the numbers before I, I um, um, would, would offer any recommendation. I think going into this, you have to have some sense of where you are on this. Um, again, I do think that um, uh, uh, using this for revenue shortfalls would not be appropriate, but um, um, I get your point and we can certainly have a, more of a conversation on that. That and might I be an add on down the road. I would want to get this one done as quickly as possible. I think right now we can say that we are all treading water, uh, just getting through the next deadline until we find out what the future is. Um, there's somebody who's a CPA pointed out to me, we have a 25% unemployment rate, but that means that 75% of us are still working. So, we probably know more after that, I'm assuming May 15th is the last payment. So mm -hmm. we'll get a better idea of, uh, we're just, we're assuming there's gonna be a shortfall in the property tax, but we don't know how much or how severe. We will probably have a better idea after May 15th. Um, and again, it will, the, it'll depend on how quickly the economy comes back. It will depend on how lenient the towns are in abating taxes. Um, we'll find that all out as we go through, but this is really just getting us through the first of the year or the first of the fiscal year um, until we get more data because we aren't even gonna have the income and the trust taxes until July 15th. And it'll depend on if the economy picks back up or if we get shut back down. Um, we're treading water. Yeah. yeah, Senator, I will verify with the league what their understanding of this is too. And ultimately it's up to you folks uh, you know, we've made a recommendation, but uh, it's up to um, both the, the, the House and the Senate committees and then in the General Assembly as a whole, uh, how far you want to go with this. Okay. And as things evolve, we can, we are going to be back here in the fall sometime. Um, we can make addition subtractions uh, once we get a better understanding of what's actually going on. But this gets us through June 1st and keeps us at the 152 million next year because that assumes property taxes are going to be paid. That's, and I'm not seeing Mark here to shake his head at me, but um, that swallow, you know, the, the deficit is the loss in the sales tax primarily. Um, so the more property tax we don't collect, the worse it's gonna be. Yep. Okay. So Beth, basically we can short, we can to get through um, next year's deficit, if we can't come up with another revenue source, um, we're, we can go to interfund borrowing lines of credit and then short-term debt. Um, mm -hmm. We'll probably get some leniency from the rating agencies on 
this year's so we at 3.7 now but and we might even get a little leniency next year but if we can't remove you know at least have a plan for replenishing the the reserves and mm -hmm. for removing the deficit the longer we go until we do that the worse it's going to be with our overall financial ratings is that yeah, I would say that's fairly, uh, for the most part, I would be hesitant to say the rating agencies will do this um, uh, yeah. or, or speak this way uh, because I can't speak for them. But I do think that um, from the literature that I've seen, from the, the commentaries that I've seen, um, again, it's, you know, they're looking through the crisis to the other side. Um, so I have more comfort, um, uh, but no guarantees with 2020. Um, as you get into into a larger problem in subsequent years, again, keep in mind that the Ed Fund is considered a major fund um, in our financial yeah. statements, and 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 uh, this this becomes more problematic, uh, and we do need to address it. Um, so again, can't speak for the folks, but I think that um, uh, there is a strategy to go forward, and um, uh, we, we need to do that. So. Okay. Committee, questions, thoughts, comments. Um, my th thought would be we won't take this up again until the House bill comes over. I'm expecting the House bill on this one will come quickly because um, we've got a limited time to get it out there for the municipalities to have some security. Uh, so if you have any questions or anything, let's get those before, you know, let's know what they are and see if we can get question, answers. Senator Pearson. Um, just to your question about timing for the treasurer, uh, is it, would we assume that municipalities sort of look into this, get ready to borrow, and then are relieved to find us covering the the interest costs? In other words, the sequence, we can't wait until the bill gets to the governor before they start exploring borrowing, I'm assuming. Yeah. Do I have that well, right? I think that, yeah, I think that um, this is going to remind me a little bit of uh, 2011 when we tried to relieve. Um, um, I shouldn't be saying this in this context, but it was a little different with the with the takeout with the infrastructure um, reimbursements from FEMA. But we delayed a um, um, a payment um, at that point in time, the December uh, uh, first payment, and the legislature was not in session, but folks could rely on uh, the 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 intent of the legislature, and I think that. Um, I think if we can get someplace down the road on this and get uh, some consensus uh, through all parties, the administration, the treasurer, um, the, um, the the general assembly, and the Vermont League of Cities. And again, as I look at the bill, you know, I, we may be talking past ourselves and what uh, what amounts um, actually get covered in terms of property tax. But that will be a decision uh, for the uh, for the general assembly. And again, how far you want to go with this, uh, but. Um, um, uh, I guess that's the bottom line for me is that um, uh, that we, we need to have some type of consensus that folks can rely on um, and preferably get this done mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And the banks, as I said, are standing ready to, to assist. Yeah, this is something most towns do as a matter of course. So it, it's not like it's going to be new. Their banks know them, they know their banks they're ready this they will they will borrow and i think we've been very clear that we weren't very fond of the idea of um just forgiving it and saying well we'll just accept the deficit uh yeah. so they've got no reason to think that we're going to change our minds this will give them an out and we, i believe this says we will reimburse them so they can know yeah. you know knowing that the cost is coming to them, eventually they will have to repay it. Um, if 
this continues and a year from now we're having the same discussion, then we've got a bigger problem. Um, remember, Moody said we were one of the 12 best states situated to weather this. So that begs the question of what are the rest of them going through? Um, and there's probably some bigger, redder states with more clout than we have um, that are going to be facing the same issues and talking to Washington. But um, right now, and the, um, the guidance that came out today, I believe the House was talking about being able to use some COVID money to do grants so that people could pay their property taxes. And um, the guidance said, nope, can't use it to offset revenue that the town's losing. And that includes payments to folks to pay their taxes. So um, we will probably have a better idea um, by the end of May but we've got to give the town, you know, as to what the shortfall will actually be, but we've got to give the towns uh, some hope uh, that they'll get through that. And then, you know, by October, maybe we'll have a better idea for how quickly the economy is going to come back um, and how quickly the unemployment rate is going to start to decline. But um, any other questions for Beth? I'm going into the manufacture of silver bullets. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I think I that's going to be a real hot item these days. <laughs> uh, you got it. You got it. Yeah. If, if I could say something hats. in conclusion. Oh, um, that, yeah. Madam Chair. If yes. I could, I just want to say if, you know, the conversation you had about uh, Moody's and, and the comments that you heard uh, that we were in, 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 in better shape than others, uh, that's because you did the right things. That's because you right. had healthy reserves. Uh, you did not have those in the 90s when, uh, when you had to do those deficit borrow, the deficit borrowing and more cash flows. So I want to congratulate the legislature in this committee uh, for the good work that you've done uh, on those issues. Uh, because we're in better shape because of it. It's still not, uh, you know, uh, still still uh, looking for that silver bullet, but uh, the bottom line is that um, uh, we're better prepared because of the foresight that uh, the General Assembly had. So thank you. We would be looking at a $59 million deficit this year if we had. Exactly. Um, and it did. And it, I, having been through those knock down drag out brawls over a penny on the tax rate, uh, holding on to that reserve um, has been difficult, but that this is what it's there for. It's not for school spending to choo choosing to spend more. It is there for when the bottom just drops out one way or the other. So, okay. if. Do you have anybody else you'd like to hear from on this? Any more information, let me know. Um, Senator Sorotkin, if you let Faith know who you'd like to hear from on those two bills. I'm, I'm in contact with her right now. Okay. Um, then we will get those up and running for a walkthrough on Thursday and then I will try and schedule a discussion with the House Committee um, about the plan that is put out. I know that Chair Briglin shares my concern that it is a really big plan and our ability to either carry it off in six months or to control the outcome. I mean, if we get very few bidders or we get bidders that only bid on places in Washington and Chittenden and Franklin County, what do we do with the places that are really hurting? So um, 
you know, we've got pockets in Washington County I've, that have very difficult time. We've seen that with some of the folks that have shown up for these meetings. But um, I think, you know, we, we really want to get the biggest bang for our buck. And I, I think we're, we're just trying to figure out how to do that. So we will schedule that, at least the group discussion on Tuesday. Hopefully by then we may have a miscellaneous tax bill and this short-term borrowing bill to, to work on. And we had a few things we were gonna put on the um, uh, miscellaneous tax bill. Senator Pearson. Madam Chair, I'm hearing that House Ways and Means is also looking at some ideas to remove the lag between in year of income and your income sensitivity, uh, at least okay. in the short term. And I, I'm, I think that's vitally important for us. And I hope we can at least understand what they're thinking about or, or yeah. do our own brainstorming. I, I, just as uh, it's really essential that we figure out some stopgap measure, I think. It, it may be possible. I think the problem with a complex engine is when you remove one part, all the rest get affected. But it's worth looking at. And I think we will have a better idea when this tax payment comes in, how much, how many people are gonna be really hurting. A fair number of these folks are gonna be renters yeah. um, that aren't employed right now. It's how many folks are really not gonna pay their property taxes and then then we'll know the size of the problem we're dealing with and we can figure out how to deal with it okay thank you all right all right i think that's it for today thank you all thank you treasurer and brad and mark um and thank you committee i have a whole half hour before i have to go back to joint fiscal and work out the acceptance of the $1.25 billion grant to the administration. <laughs> Sarah McDonald, did you do you have something to say? No. I'm gonna go spread, I'm gonna go spread fertilizer and drive fence posts. Fertilizer is a good word for it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, committee. We're all gonna go now.